Thank you very much for all who have made it in time. Uh, I can see we have about 16 participants going to 22 and the number is growing. And we have a very interesting, very topical, very um, nice uh, discussion this afternoon. Uh, this afternoon, our discussion is on taxation of digital platforms. I want to call it taxation of digital assets uh, because businesses operate through assets and through platforms. And we are looking at the tax that's imposed on uh, these digital platforms. Uh, allow me to just give a little bit of background. Um, uh, we are in the fourth industrial revolution, which is majorly a digital or technology revolution. Uh, we, we have evolved from the feudal states to the industrial revolution, where corporation income tax and em employment taxes grew. Uh, we have had uh, four industrial revolutions happen, and we had a fourth, uh, which is the tech, tech revolution. And because uh, taxes are as certain as death, they have been with us since time immemorial. So tax has to evolve with the evolution of the commerce, with the evolution of the economy. The economy has since evolved, and now we have what we call digital assets. Maybe to put into perspective, digital assets or digital platforms or digital services means uh, the ability of businesses to operate through multiple jurisdictions without having the brick and mortar or without having physical presence. We have seen them, they are here, they are happening. You have Facebook. I don't think we have a Facebook office in Uganda. We have Netflix. I don't think we have a Facebook uh, Netflix office in Kenya. Uh, we have uh, Amazon. I doubt we have one in Tanzania, uh, but they're operating and doing a lot of business uh, in, in uh, East Africa or East uh, or Africa at large. So these are businesses that can operate anywhere in the world without having a physical address. And that the question that we're going to address today or the question that the panel of experts is going to address today is how are the tax regimes or tax uh, regulators posed? How are they uh, coming together to tax these digital assets? One of the challenges uh, uh, is the fact that digital assets or, or, or digital services uh, are not ordinarily present in, an, in, 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 a, in a jurisdiction. And therefore, having to tax that service where someone is not physically there may not be possible. But with me, the panel of experts who are going to dissect and give us uh, best practices and best approaches on how to approach this taxation of digital assets. Uh, what has been discussed around the world, what are the, have, have other countries, African and outside of Africa done to combat this uh, taxation of digital assets? Um, the panel is, is wide. We have a panel from all East African countries, save for South Sudan and Rwanda. I've not got anyone, but I'm sure people in Burundi will ably uh, discuss that. We have a panel from Kenya, from Tanzania, from Uganda, and from Burundi. And I'll kick off with, uh, with, with, a, with a gentleman from uh, Tanzania. He's the one right in front of me, Mr. Nwamanya. I don't know if Nwamanya is Ugandan or Tanzanian, because we also have a Nwamanya in Uganda. But Mr. Nwamanya, um, I, we just want to briefly, I know Tanzania has introduced a digital services tax. Uh, I think it's 2% of revenues for non-residents. I don't know if it has become operational at the moment, um, but we want you to tell us how Tanzania has tried to, to cope or to, to, to harness, harness this issue of digital tax. Mr. Nwamanya, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Um, yes, uh, for Loud the position. Good, thank you. So uh, to answer your first question, uh, Joseph Nwamanya is from Uganda in Barara. It uh, doesn't mean that <laughs> I can be in Tanzania. I'm in Tanzania, I've been here for a while. Um, uh, yes, uh, you try, you're quite right that Tanzania has actually um, uh, taken on uh, the position of uh, digital taxation. Um, this segment was meant for Mr. Juvenal Betambira. Mr. Juvenal. Uh, yes, Joseph, I was struggling to connect. And uh, uh, So if you can allow me, sir, Ian, 
uh, let me pass that to Jovenant because we uh, agreed that he would uh, do this segment. Uh, Jovenant uh, had not introduced himself, but he's uh, the leading partner at BDO East Africa, the Tanzanian office. Um, Karibu, Jovenant. Jovenant, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Thank Juvenal. you. And uh, Thank the, you, you put on your video so that we can see who you are. Unfortunately, my video, my video cannot go on. It is uh, not working now. I'm in Kampala. I think Kampala internet doesn't yeah. like me. So I think that's where the problem <laughs> is. So I, I, I cannot switch on the video, but uh, I, I think you can hear me. It's okay, Juvenile. Please, please go ahead. So I, I, since I've just joined, maybe uh, because I just joined and uh, Joseph immediately said I can proceed. So just please uh, give me some, maybe one minute of clarification what I'm supposed to be addressing. Yes, uh, sorry, Juvenal. Um, I, we were talking about the experience of Tanzania. Uh, I gave a backdrop that uh, we have, we know Tanzania has introduced a digital services tax, though not yet operational, which is I think 2% of revenues for now and residents. Uh, we just want to know yeah. how that is working in Tanzania and whether you have any, any law in the, in the making on uh, specifics of that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I want to introduce myself first. I'm a juvenile. I'm the managing partner for BDO in Tanzania. Uh, I'm an auditor. And um, in Tanzania, um, what has just happened, in the new finance act, um, the law now requires that all service providers in the form of digital service providers who are non-residents, effective July uh, 2022, now need to register in Tanzania uh, for VAT and also for income tax. So all of the invoices that will be coming from abroad for electronic services, effective July 1st, will be attracting 18% VAT and 2% income tax. And the minister has made it simple for non-residents to register and get a tax identification number to pay the 2% tax, and also to register for VAT and file monthly returns and pay the 18% VAT. They have been given a, um, a grace period of six months from July uh, so after six months, everyone must comply uh, if you want to do business and supply electronic services in Tanzania if you are non-resident. And the non-resident, uh, if you are supplying services that are consumed by a resident in Tanzania, the new Finance Act of 2022 treats you as a resident for VAT and for income tax purposes in that regard for the 2% and the 18%. Then you, can, you are required to file monthly VAT returns. And the returns have been simplified. The registration forms also have been simplified. Because in the past, you'd have to appoint a VAT representative, which was a very complicated process. But now you can go to the commissioner, you apply, and you get a tax identification number. You get a value-added uh, tax number. And then immediately, you start filing your returns and paying the 18% and the 2%. And you are not eligible to claim any input, input VAT. You can only pay the VAT. But then there would not be any input VAT for you if you are supplying electronic services from abroad to a Tanzanian entity. So that's the new law, which is going to take effects in the next uh, two months, two, three months, because we have been given a grace period of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of six months. And this one affects suppliers of uh, software, um, anything that you supply on the internet, gaming platforms, softwares, programs, computer programs, anything of that so all of that is applicable the list is endless in terms of the electronic services so that is the new position with regard to tanzania effective july 1st this year thank you very much Juven Juv juvenile juvenile juvenal. yes juvenile thank you very much just a follow-up question juvenile okay juvenile so just a few a follow-up question um you you said that you register and then pay two percent tax how does that com co um, compete with uh, companies that are already uh, registered and doing the similar service in Tanzania as, you, as opposed to these uh, digital companies? So are you saying they pay 2% on revenues and the other companies will pay a higher percentage on, on their income? Yeah. Now, if you're a resident and you have a permanent establishment, 
it means you are going to pay 30 percent income tax in addition to the 18 percent VAT. But because you, if you are not a resident, the government has found a way because you come and do business, you earn your income in Tanzania. So the minimum you pay will be 18 percent uh, and two percent. So maximum will be 20 percent. But a resident person would have to pay uh, the 18 percent, and we also have to pay 30 percent on the tax uh, tax before profit, as like any other company in Tanzania would do. But at least the government would have gotten 2% and 18% from you, which is maximum 20%. Now a resident, a resident entity will pay 30% plus the 18, almost 40%. But then when you are a resident, you also have other taxes, uh, like with all the other payers you earn and all the other taxes that are involved. But when you're a foreigner, you just supply, get your money, you go out, but the government will want the 18% and then the 2% on the services we are supplying from abroad to a resident entity. But they have made it very simple to apply and register. That's the good thing they have done. So there's not going to be uh, any question on, it will take time to register. No, there are forms already. Uh, templates have been designed by the TRA, who is a regulator there, tax uh, collector. And, um, so, and then you apply. And I think the, the process will be much smoother. That's what they have done very well. Because in the past, registering would be taking a lot of time. Now it will be straightforward. You go register simply, then you start paying your tax. I only see an issue in terms of enforcing it, because if you are abroad, I would then ensure that you actually pay the tax. So I'm, I'm looking at a scenario where they are going to force the, the consumer of the services in Tanzania to help them to enforce the collection of this tax. It will reach a time that if you are not able to pay the tax, then you are not going to be able to do business in the country. So I think uh, that is the, the way they are going to use to collect these taxes. It has not happened yet. So we all look forward to see how it's going to work. But everyone is preparing themselves uh, to do this. Because this is going to affect everyone, like big banks, uh, the gaming companies, and uh, IT companies, and anyone who consumes electronic services from, from out of the country. Thank you very much, Juvenal. Um, it will be interesting to see how that plays out uh, in light of uh, local players who provide the same services, because I see a little bit of unfairness. Maybe if 2% uh, is does not take into consideration any expenses or any allowable deductions, but uh, it's, it will be interesting how to play how that will play out in the Tanzanian market. I will quickly move forward uh, to the Ugandan market. I uh, have an, an expert in Uganda. I know in Uganda we have introduced a value added tax for non resident service providers, effective 1st July 2022. And I would like to see um, how that will play out in Uganda as well. Uh, seasoned uh, tax lawyer uh, Sefas Birunji is here to give us a Ugandan input. Sefas, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. <clears throat> um, Uganda does not have. Uh, a digital service tax in the form uh, of Tanzania in the form Juvenile uh, laid out as a separate tax called digital service tax. However, it definitely has digital uh, service taxes in different forms. I just mentioned the uh, most uh, impactful, I think, uh, uh, taxes related to excess duties, excess duties which were imposed on telecommunications and other platforms had a very big impact from uh, 2018 when they were imposed uh, on uh, several media. media. And uh, so we had a lot of uh, excess duties related to communications withdraw money, mobile money, or kind of over the top services and uh, very many other names in the extra duty area. In the VAT area, as uh, Ian has said, uh, since this year, January, uh, a tax has been imposed on non-residents. Similar very much to what Juvenal has said. What Juvenal has said seems to be an income tax but this is uh, a VAT and uh, I'm yet to see how far it has gone. I think uh, the impact is yet to be measured. It is still the same issues. How enforceable is it? How does it relate 
relate to the existing law related to imported services, which mainly means that is the consumer being impacted. The, the consumer currently is required to be the one to file the returns. But now with this uh, new law requiring the registration of non-residents, it would mean that the non-resident files the return. But at the same time, it has not specified that the imported services, the one who consumes imported services does not file. So it, it appears that once it is in practice, there might be some conflict area. It is also important to note that uh, say compared to Kenya, where the regulations are more detailed. Here, it is a public notice half page with about 100 words without too many explanations about uh, how it is supposed to be operated, apart from saying that uh, the non-residents will register. Indeed, we saw a few uh, well-known names indicating that they had registered for VAT or issuing invoices here and there. But I think that is not really uh, enough for a, a professional to analyze the impact. Uh, one other uh, very significant area where these uh, digital platforms are taxed is in the gaming area. I think where almost all the assessments are related to, to, to uh, digital platforms and audits are conducted based on uh, their digital tax based, uh, based audits. So what happens is that most of the time, the taxman seems to be relying on auditing existing taxpayers, which kind of begs the question, because most of the users of Netflix and other platforms are not really taxpayers, so uh, the handle is a bit difficult. So unless you use the medium of the communications regulator or the service provider like uh, telecoms audit, you may not capture much. So it looks like there is a lot of room to be covered in that area. Uh, Ian, I don't know whether that's a sufficient highlight to, to introduce the part of Uganda, but as a direct tax, as an income tax, we don't have a digital service tax with a different tax head. So digital services are basically being taxed through traditional withholding taxes. So unless you can see a payer, somebody who has expensed a payment to a non-resident, the, the, the tax regulator may not easily identify the tax. In other words, it is still focused on the tax base, which is known to the uh, tax authority. Uh, th thank you very much, Cephas. Uh, that uh, covers uh, the Ugandan aspect very well. Just a follow-up question on, on what you have presented. Uh, Uganda has taken the indirect tax approach where they have uh, levied VAT as opposed to the direct tax of income tax. Do you think that that, that, that works better for taxation of these services? And uh, if it's passed on to the customer, because most indirect taxes will be paid by the customer or the consumer, would you think that would work better? I don't think it will necessarily work better. It looks to me as if uh, the policymakers are still on a fishing expedition. If you look at how it has progressed from Kenya to Tanzania, I will not be surprised to find that uh, Uganda will try to introduce it sometime. As you are aware, Ian, as a, a seasoned tax person, our, our policies many times seem to be short term. You do not find a paper which is highlighting long term when you are supposed to have a digital tax or when how important services are supposed to roll out into registration of non-residents. You just wake up one day and you have a public notice about taxation of non-residents. So there isn't a detailed policy plan. So for that reason, I think there is no detailed analysis to see where there is a double, pay, a double taxation uh, to analyze the incident of the incidence of tax. For example, when you look at these uh, excise taxes I've referred to, they basically impact on the income taxes and on the VATs. And you find that in the rollout of tax, there is no clear explanation of whether the VAT is on, on top of the in excise duty or excise duty is on top of the VAT 
or, or whether uh, these taxes are deductibles in the income tax, because most of the time it just says it's on the gross, gross payment. So I think we have a lot to do with the clear policy. And I think when we next have uh, a presentation like this, we need to have the policy makers actually telling us what is supposed to happen. Because in many cases you find it is as if the policy is being driven by the regulator. And of course the regulator is most interested in the net basket, the total collection, rather than the uh, tax impact. So I, I cannot tell whether one is better than the other. I can just expect that we may very soon be seeing the digital taxes in addition. And as you have said, if you have a situation where that impact for residents is 30% and for non-residents is 2%, you may find that it is actually a higher incident of tax on the residents. Uh, which would mean that for the non-residents, you just want to capture them to, to, to get to know that you are taxing them. But if you are taxing them by voluntary registration, it means they are actually transferring the incidence to the consumer. So basically, you are not even taxing the non-resident. You are just making the non-resident a collector. Over to you, Ian. Uh, thank you very much, Cephas, for that dissect. It's been very, very informative. Uh, I can see Uganda, as you said, may take on Kenya and Tanzanian route to introduce a digital service tax, but we're still in the pipeline trying to find out how that would work. I want to jump over quickly to Burundi. Uh, Burundi and Rwanda have, have gotten the policies, but I don't know if they have uh, en enacted any laws. And with us is uh, Doreen Irakoze. Doreen, uh, please give us uh, the, 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 the update for, for the Burundi uh, regulator. Doreen, are you on? Yes, yes, Chair. Yes, and over to you, Doreen. Thank you. Um, regarding to Burundi, regarding to the position in Burundi, there is no specific legal and tax system for digital platforms only that they are subject to taxes like any other type of company. Uh, but uh, last year, the government has introduced a tax, um, a tax for communicate, I mean, for gigabytes for data, which is of 18% and has been effective from July last year. So, uh, apart from that, um, we have broad provisions provided under taxation laws, such as income tax laws and um, other taxation laws. And in addition to that, we have a taxation regime on individual, specifically on income tax, whereby non-resident are taxed only on Burundi source income including income generated from professional activities or other services carried out in Burundi. And regarding corporates now, foreign companies are normally taxed only on Burundi source income, means income earned by non-resident from any service provided either physically or electronically to a person resident in Burundi is deemed to be income sourced in Burundi. So in brief, um, in brief, the law firm is not clear on to whether the digital platform on how they are specifically uh, taxed, apart from the 18 tax which has been introduced. And in addition, I would like to mention that VAT is imposed on the sale of goods and the provision of services like digital services and the standard rate as previous speakers have said is 18 also in Burundi. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Doreen. Uh, uh, as you've mentioned, Burundi doesn't have a specific policy, but I think they use the withholding taxes for sourced income as well as VAT 
to, to try and tap into the, the revenues of these uh, digital platforms. Uh, it's been very insightful as, as of now, and I know that in 2020, the East African countries, the six East African countries came together to agree on how to jointly tackle digital the digital economy. And I'm sure that at that point in time, uh, they're trying to craft ways and means on how best to, to, to have this done. Juveno, I see your hand up. Do you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to add some few things. Yes, you know. Tanzania, yes. Yeah, just to clarify that, uh, as you know, all imported services, uh, if service, if we are anyone, we are making a payment out of Tanzania for services, you are supposed to deduct 15% withholding tax. So these transactions will attract um, VAT of 18%, income tax of 2%. And there's also going to be 15% uh, withholding tax. Because any payment that you make up for services out of the country, you have to deduct 15%. So if you look at the total tax uh, amount, you are coming to around 35%. So that I had not mentioned that. So withholding tax will still apply. But the TRA has actually already designed the templates for filing these returns. The income tax is on the gross revenue. All the invoice amounts, Top line, 2%. They have even prepared the returns, the format of how the returns will be. They've also given you the returns of how the VAT returns will be. So what the non-resident will do is to appoint a firm like ours or any other service provider in the country to help them to prepare the return and submit it to the Tanzania Revenue Authority. It's, it, I think that, that is better than asking you to register and become a permanent establishment. Because once you become a part of the establishment, then you have to have other taxes, and there are so many other reporting requirements. So I think uh, the electronic service providers would choose uh, this option to the alternative, which would have been for them re required to register and set up business in the country. Also, I've also we, there are challenges already taking place because gaming, gaming services in Tanzania are exempt uh, from VAT, and most of the electronic electronic service providers, they thought that they should be exempt also from VAT, even the, the foreign ones. I have had some clients coming and saying, we are supplying gaming platforms. If we are on the ground, they would be exempt for VAT. Now we are supplying them from abroad. We are being charged VAT. So they, they, they are already uh, arguments and, and, and discussions around this. And because it's a new thing, because if, if they have been local and they are supplying gaming services, and electronic, then they would be exempt from VAT. Now, because they are supplying similar services or clothes from abroad, they are charging VAT. So I have already seen some clients from abroad in the UK and the US already complaining about this. Uh, but that I think the TRA will find a way of ironing it out. So I wanted to clarify that the returns have already been uh, uh, prepared. The templates are already available. There is going to be withholding tax also that would normally apply, but there would not be VAT, but now withholding tax is there. Because in the past, any imported services would attract what we call reverse VAT. You would put in the VAT output and then you claim it in. The new law does not allow you to claim the input VAT. So it means it will be a cost, which is unavoidable. But the 15% withholding tax will also be paid and then the 2% income tax. So if you come, then it, the total picture will be about 35%. I wanted to make that clarification. Uh, thank you very much, Juvenal, uh, for that clarification. Uh, what Juvenal is saying is that in addition to the 2% and 18% uh, uh, VAT, they'll have a uh, withholding tax on import of services or withholding tax uh, levied on, on, on incomes and from Tanzania. Um, I want to quickly jump to, to Jilna. Jilna is a, is a tax director with RSM East Africa. So I imagine she covers all the East African countries. Jilna, do you have any experience with the Kenyan market? Do you, do you want to give us some experience with the Kenyan market if you do? Uh, thank you, Ian. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, I think from a Kenyan perspective, we are a bit ahead of the game in terms of the application of DST. For us, the, the application for DST was effective from 1st January 2021. 
at a rate of one and a half percent. In our recent um, uh, Finance Act, there was a bill that was passed to increase it to three percent. However, that did not go through, so the rate still remains at one and a half percent on the provision of any digital services, basically anything that is supplied over the internet, any service that is supplied over the internet, or if you're uh, uh, dealing through any digital marketplace. So for example, you have your Amazon or anyone, if you derive any, say commission or anything, that, that would be subjected to a local uh, charge of DST at one and a half percent on the income earned from a user in Kenya. So if you're supplying to a user in Kenya that is located in Kenya. <coughs> Sorry. The other thing to note is in Kenya, the DST is only applicable to a non-resident. So if you're a local entity, a Kenyan entity, or you're a non-resident with a permanent establishment, obviously the logic behind it is that you're already paying local taxes here. So you will not be charged any DST. So it's only a non-resident without a permanent establishment would be subjected to DST in Kenya. I think they, the KRA, uh, the Kenya Revenue Authority has really um, widened the scope of catching people from foreign because they are working directly with the communications authority in Kenya to identify a lot of, and they've invested significantly on on this digital intervention and trying to catch as many foreign non-residents who are supplying services through the internet. Uh, obviously, that is a vast uh, list of people because you see it's very wide here. It's any digital service, anything that you provide through the internet, through an electronic platform. So any service that is going through the web will be subjected to that DSD, but you have to be a non-resident. Um, I think for that's from an income tax perspective, but one thing to note is that that one and a half percent that you're paying would only be applicable if there was no withholding tax already deducted on that income. So for example, I as a resident of Kenya is importing a, a service, say a professional service, on which obviously I am required to withhold tax. So the there's no double tax. You cannot charge withholding and DST here in Kenya. That's the difference, I think, from uh, the, my Tanzanian counterpart basically saying two of them would be applicable. That's not how it is. Withholding tax would take priority in Kenya. So if I'm already withholding uh, a certain amount on that, say, professional fee that has been uh, provided through the internet, then there's, that amount will not be subjected to DST. That's the difference to note. Uh, then uh, the other part is that one and a half percent that you're paying, I think the non-residents then need to check whether that would be allowable as a credit against their income because that's the income that they'll be declaring in their home countries. So whether the foreign tax credit would be allowable, that is the tax paid in Kenya, is something that that non-resident also needs to bear in mind. Um, I think from a registration perspective, before I get to the VAT registration, it's there are two options. You can either go under the simplified tax registration framework, where you just have to provide, you know, your certificate of incorporation where that non-resident is incorporated and their national uh, identification number, the tax reference number. I'm guessing like here we have a PIN number. I'm sure they have something else in their respective country and registration is fairly simple you can even do it on you know online by themselves they just have to register the same get the pin the pin would only be with uh, a, an obligation the tax obligation sorry the tax obligation which they will be given would only be for dst and vat if applicable but i'll get to the vat part uh, the other thing that they need to note is it's a monthly filing so you just have to ensure by 20th of the following month you've declared the tax and paid it as well. From, I think, getting to a VAT perspective, that non-resident, the law just changed recently under the Finance Act 2022, where 
Previously, if you so there are two types of supplies. You'd have the B2B or the B2C, business to business, business to consumer. I'm not sure uh, whether I should delve into each, but now they've removed that. So whether you are supplying, so if Netflix is supplying to me in my private, uh, to me privately, it is now the obligation of Netflix to declare the VAT here in Kenya. The other option before it used to be was that uh, if I was a, a registered business and I was to pay Zoom for utilizing this platform, for example, because I'm making a taxable supply, I'm a consumer. I'm sorry, I'm a business. So it's a B2B. In that setup previously, it used to be that I would be accounting for reverse VAT. So reverse VAT is obviously where you pay the output VAT and then you claim the same in the same month. But that's being done by the user of that service, which is the resident here. Now that has changed from 1st July 2022, where now it's the, the onus of declaring and paying the VAT is now on the non-resident. So that's the difference between, again, that's on the uh, a monthly filing, which is on the 20th of the following month. You need to have declared the taxes and also paid the same. Um, I think that covers, I think, a majority because everything else is quite uh, well covered by even the other um, counterparts. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Uh, thank you, Jilna. Uh, that, that, that's that's very, very insightful. Uh, thank you for each and every one of you has given us insight on the individual um, uh, countries that they are from. Um, I, I just want to pose a question, and, and I think that this is this cuts through um, most of our panelists. Enforcement. Uh, Juvenal, uh, Jilna, Doreen, and also Sefas have all said uh, this is new. They're trying to test it out and everything. I want to see how or the, the panel or the, the audience would want to know how would it be enforced if you're asking Netflix or Amazon to register and pay 2% of the gross revenues? Is there a mechanism of tracking these revenues that they're earning in this particular market, especially the fact that most of their customers are individuals who sometimes don't have pins or tins or not registered anywhere for tax? How would that play out to the tax revenues? And I'm throwing this question to the panel. Anyone uh, is free to answer. Okay, so I can answer from the revenue authorities in Kenya, for example, they are working very closely with, as I said, with the communications authority in Kenya, where they, and they've also, the revenue authority here has also invested a lot in technology to get this data from uh, the platforms themselves. I think, I mean, working with CAK, so there is a lot of information share that's happening, and that information also gives them uh, an estimate of what is being earned by these non-residents and hence they're able to assess them. I have received so many people, like I would say so many taxpayers from non, like from abroad who have now said, I've received this notification from KRA, we are supplying. So it's through this intelligence network which they have with the revenue, uh, the communications authority. And that's where they are able to get this information at least from a Kenyan perspective. And I'm guessing the other authorities would be doing the same thing, but I'll let them comment. Thank you. Thank you, Jilna. Uh, Jovena, any, any comments on that? Yep. Um, like uh, Jilna has said, in Tanzania, TCRA, which is the regulator for all telecommunication services, is responsible for issuing licenses to all internet providers, anyone to do with electronic services, has to get a license from them. So they already have a database of who is doing electronic business. So I, I, they have not done this, but because this is a new thing for us, what I'm thinking is they are going to compare TCRA to supply data. They are going, you see, what, what the revenue authorities do in East Africa is always similar. I'm sure Tanzania will be borrowing what Kenya is already doing, uh, successfully doing, by using the same software, uh, uh, technology and intelligence, to ensure that they have all the information. They might also compel the consumers of the services to give them information. Uh, because remember, the consumers of all these services in the country, the ones who are already registered and paying taxes, they have to, call to, 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 to in their returns, they report 
uh, what we call a, a reverse VAT, uh, like Gina has said, where you have to show that all of the invoices you have gotten from abroad for all of the services you have consumed from abroad. So that information, they already have it in the VAT returns that are filed by all of the companies that are doing this business. And TCR also has a lot of information. So I'm sure they are going to use both the consumers of the services and the regulator to ensure that they, they capture a majority of the, of, 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 the custom, of the customers. Now, if they are individuals buying things online on Amazon, of course, that will be very difficult to enforce. Uh, but the law, I'm sure, will keep on evolving from year up to year. Changes will be made in the next financial year. And, uh, uh, but they cannot, they cannot collect tax from 100% of, of the consumers of these services. Of course, it's not uh, possible. So that's how I think it's going to be done. Uh, I'm not very sure, but I think that's what they are going to borrow from Kenya and any other countries that have already done this. In, it could be in Europe, in America, and ETC. Thank you, Jimmy. I'll, I'll, I'll just jump over to some two questions I don't want to miss now. Uh, Andrew Musioka, I think, is in Kenya. He's asking, is it legal to source information from the communication authority? Is it, is it legal? to source information from a communication authority. And also uh, Alex Kanye from Kenya still says that Kenya authority is working closely with the banks. And if you're paying by card, then it's likely that Kenya Re regulatory authorities radar is capturing that transaction. So for Kenya, they have, they have I think, opened up the economy so that uh, the, the banks or the regulator can know what activity you're taking, taking place in your bank account. And also, whether it's legal or not, I think Jilna, she commented she's not a lawyer. So I don't know if Jilna... Yes, I'm not that. a lawyer, so I'm not in a position to comment whether that's legal or not. But okay. uh, yeah, if there's anybody who's a Kenyan lawyer who can assist, happy okay. to... And anyone who can I assist? Think I have yes. the same answer, uh, and I think Joseph Nwamanya from Tanzania would be best placed to answer that. But what yeah. I know is that our government, they already collect so much information without our knowledge. Uh, whether it is legal or not, I know it is being done, and it would not be uh, out of the moon for them to do it even in this circumstance if they want to collect revenue. But maybe Joseph can uh, speak about the law in Tanzania. Joseph, you want to make a comment on that? Uh, yes, I'd want to make a comment. So um, it's very, if you could repeat the question, and uh, if I understand it correct, is whether it is uh, legal to collect information from the um, regulator, authority. from the communication authority. Uh, so the question would be, who is to collect that information? Is it the tax authority? So, um, <laughs> so we have a series of laws that actually restrict uh, sharing of especially personal information, but those same laws always um, issue or rather have what we call clawback clauses, which um, then allow or open gateways at the back of, of such rooms that such information can be shared if it is going to be used for um, certain lawful purposes. And I'm pretty sure this would be one of the circumstances without quickly looking through the law. In short, you would not be able to beat the government uh, or any regulatory authorities in these circumstances. Okay, thank you the question. Th thank you very much, Joseph. I, I, again, I would like to bounce back to the panel members. Um, just a few questions from maybe if I can throw it to the audience. Um, we have had a, what they call the Economic Cooperation, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, mm -hmm. that has come up with the, uh, different, different pillars on how to tackle uh, uh, taxation of a digital economy. I would like to particularly add that we do not have a one answer fits all. It's still a try and error, even around the world. So we have a, a little bit of, of, of experiences with the OECD and, 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 and other jurisdictions. So I'll just provide to put to our panel members again at random, uh, whether you think that the OECD approaches to taxation of digital economy would apply in an African market. And if so, what, 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 what would be your comment on them? Uh, so I just want to throw it to the panel members. Maybe Cephas, if you would like to have a comment on that, on OECD approaches of digital tax. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think the OECD is well known for uh, putting in a lot of effort in understanding these tax processes and uh, doing a due diligence. You, when you look at pillar one, uh, pillar two, models done by OECD, they have really taken time and studied a lot of the 
economic processes in their countries, in, the, in, in their respective countries. And when you try to read through the, their output, you really find a lot of complicated stuff. But uh, basically, they have talked about digital taxes, they have talked about concept of uh, significance presence, they have talked about uh, the turnover basis. Now, when you look at uh, Pillar 2, which is talking about uh, like a 15%, you find that, uh, first of all, most of these taxes are to do with the uh, income taxes, much more than the others. Uh, because I think under most of them, uh, VAT is a very uh, domestic tax. They don't want it to cross borders and have different principles across borders. Uh, when you look at Peter 2 and he's talking about a 15% minimum tax, and you compare it, for example, with Kenya, which is talking of 1.5%, and Tanzania 2%, then you say, okay, why, why this uh, very big difference between the two rates? And uh, again, you find that they are saying, uh, we are going to impose this on companies which have a turnover of either $750 million per year or something like that, which is really out of question for almost all of us. So they have recognized the enormity of the problem if you try to get everyone. And that goes back to what Jirna says. If you use the Communications Commission, uh, in, in Uganda, I think uh, the approach has been more to use the telecommunication companies rather than to use the communication regulator, because I think the telecommunication commissions, I mean, the telecommunication companies are taxpayers. Therefore, getting information from them is easier relating to the earlier question of do you have authority to uh, get this information when you are getting it from mtn for example in uganda you are just looking at whom are you paying you look at who, who, who are your withholders who are your where do you expense so already the tax body has automatic information it has an easy source and it finds that it can compare much faster than it would compare a communications commission if, for example, the, 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 the authority found it was ahead in terms of uh, the software as it needed, then the regulator then it would find the challenge. So I think in Kenya, maybe the two are at par. So you find if you were going to capture everyone, like you are saying Kenya is doing at the moment, they reach a stage where they have a lot too much, to, too much information to synthesize properly. So that's why possibly the OECD has uh, said, let's benchmark a certain turnover and we can manage that information. Otherwise we could have a, an information overload, which we may not use uh, if efficiently. Of course, you also know that uh, some tax bodies here are not so uh, carried away by being uh, very friendly to taxpayers. So they wouldn't mind too much what happens in the process. But I think this is a learning area, and I think uh, if we move uh, tentatively getting the Kenyan experience, uh, we could significantly increase the tax base. But if I went back to Jirna and asked what has been the revenue impact, how much has been collected uh, since the tax was started, is it meeting the expectations, is it growing? So those lessons need to be learned. So the, OIS, uh, the ESC countries which we are in need to learn from uh, OECD, but at the same time, I'm happy that they have taken their own line of saying, let's start from a very small rate and we capture everyone we can. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sefas. Um, I'm going to throw out a question to Doreen as well. Doreen, um, what do you think yeah. about the OECD um, uh, approach? Yeah. Yes, thank you, Chair. Chair. Um, first, I would like to highlight that Burundi is actually an outsider to the OCD inclusive framework on base erosion and profit shifting. This means we have a high risk of base erosion and profit shifting for digital platform, which are not resident in Burundi, but which are providing digital services for two Burundians. Then my position is um, we still need um, a strong political will regarding to decision 
and especially for technical issues which need to be resolved. For example, for pillar one, issues around which business activities will be covered, element of for formula to be allocated and other issues around the pillar one approach should be more assessed on a, on a, um, a development um, a development way of implementation and also regarding to pillar two i may say that there are some technical implementation issues that may arise in the course of implementation and we need uh, again a strong political will to a strong political will to for this implementation to be done and also technical institutions must be involved thank you chair thank you very much doreen uh juvenal over to you Uh, Even, Ian, yes. can, can you can you repeat the question? The, the question is is uh, on the on the implementation through OECD pillars. Um, what what's your take? What's your view on the OECD approach to taxation of digital assets? I think what Tanzania is doing is actually in line with the uh, that those guidelines. Only that we have not put a limit on how much money you are getting out of the country. Anyone who supplies whichever amount has to pay the 2% the and the 18%. Now, the, the, the guidelines had brought in very big numbers. Um, there are very few people who get that kind of money from our country. So um, I think Tanzania has done it. This is the first time doing it, considering the circumstances of the country. It's going to change. As you know, the laws keep on evolving. I'm sure after this financial year, lessons would have been learned. Uh, mistakes would have been created. But then in the next financial year, I'm expecting 22, 23, there are going to be changes. Uh, maybe after borrowing a lot of knowledge from Kenya, like Gina has already said, uh, increase the sources of improved source of information and all that. Because it's a new thing for us. So we are all looking forward to see how it's going to work. But uh, I'm sure it's going to work because the, the government already has a lot of data who has been supplying these services. So next year, around this time, if we have another meeting like this, then we'll have much more information. At the moment, uh, it is all a gray area. Uh, th thank you, Juvena. Lastly, Jilna, your comments on the OECD uh, pillars. Thank you. I think um, from an OECD perspective, we, we are only four countries actually that have not joined the inclusive framework and Kenya currently is still debating and I think there is a concern that um, currently that one and a half percent that they are deriving from the revenue uh, from these digital services, remember under the inclusive framework, the, there might be an issue of, you know, the two pillars. So how the two pillars work is being evaluated and what will it benefit for Kenya? Because currently DST is actually favorable for us because of whatever information that is Sorry, whatever, uh, sorry, whatever revenue that is being earned is straight away subjected to one and a half percent. Under the pillar one approach, for example, there's only a certain percentage of the profits from those non-residents, those large multinationals, if we qualify under that would come to us in Kenya. So that is where the concern is by the revenue authorities as present. So it's a question of, um, whether to go for it or not. So I think there are only two African countries, Kenya and Nigeria, that are still contemplating whether to join the framework or not, because it might not be that always that framework will be favorable for, for the revenue authorities, the local authority in terms of collection, because we might actually be losing out more on the revenue aspect. Because how, for example, under pillar one, although they are saying that that multinational, first of all, it has to be an a large multinational meeting a certain criteria of revenue, I think it was around 20 billion euros, then even for the local entity, uh, if that million, uh, uh, a certain amount, I think it's a $1 million, sorry, euro turnover is the one that would qualify. 
to even be taxed in Kenya, in that jurisdiction. So the rules are quite complex. I mean, you, it takes a bit of time to go through and understand how even the numbers are going to work in terms of calculating that amount that would qualify for tax here in Kenya, in the local jurisdiction. And maybe that's why the revenue authority here is being a bit a bit um, hesitant in joining, because right now it will just be only a certain amount vis-a-vis what they are collecting currently is much higher. So that's the, the position. Uh, although the 15%, again, it would follow as, as a, because pillar one and pillar two go together. So obviously, if you don't qualify under pillar one, then you won't even reach the 15%, the threshold that they are talking about, the minimum tax that they ought to have paid. And remember, East African, hardly any any IP or anything is being kept here. Most of the time they're being transferred to a low tax or a no tax jurisdiction. So that's the tax planning every multinational has done that provides this sort of a service. So again, loss of revenue. So yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, panel, panelists. Um, I, before I open it up to the 159 people attending online, I just wanted to say, uh, again, just a, a small comment that the panelists can think about as we take on this, these questions. Uh, do you think a license type of consumption tax would probably cover better? Where you say if uh, a, a, a digital services platform wants to operate in a jurisdiction, they should get a license or pay a certain annual license fee, regardless of the user, so that they can tap some of that revenue. Again, that, that's something to think about as we close this. I want to open it up to the attendants or the people attending. If you have any questions or comments, please raise your Uh, so that we can select you. Um, I'm seeing Louis Chizito. Louis Chizito, over to you. The microphone is yours. Please ask the question. Chizito, Louis? Are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. My question goes to all the panelists. I, I hope they can hear me clearly. Yes, we can hear you, sir. Now, I've been reading the consultation documents on digital service taxes. There is the UK, there is Switzerland, there is, uh, I think there's also, I, uh, France passed the digital services tax, but now here is my concern. Should emerging nations that have low access to technology and an uptake of technology be rushing to think of taxing before they even, now this is a policy consideration uh, question. It's not a practical uh, tax practice question. Now, the question is, we are still struggling with uptake of technology. Some of us have been advising startups in this area. Mm -hmm. We are burdening them with compliance of taxation. But uh, should we be quick to embrace the pillar one and pillar pillars of the OECD when we are still struggling? I don't know how that has worked. You know, we copied and replicated the OECD international taxation model. Uh, how has it worked for us in terms of illicit financial flows? The UN model was even more favorable for us, but it hasn't worked. And then lastly, uh, I think as East Africa, we need to come down. I think God is an East African platform. We should come together and find a way to harmon harmonize taxation of the digital economy. Now you have decentralized finance. How are you going to deal with that? You may think you're taxing the centralized systems. Now, I'll conclude with this. A major study, I think, that was, I think it was done by PwC, it assessed the impact of the France's digital services tax, which I think passed in 2019. It says that, and this is research I think I can put out there, that the companies actually will end up paying 5% of that tax. 40% will actually pass on to smaller businesses, and then 55% on to the everyday consumers. So I think there should be a, a, a way of harmonizing the positions across the five countries, and we see how we can get better. Otherwise, if Kenya is, if Kenya is actually undercutting all of us in the digital space, Kenya is one of the big four investments for venture capital. Everyone on this platform is aware. Anyone who has structured a venture capital deal knows that Kenya is ahead of everyone in this region. And that is why Kenya is even reluctant to join these so-called pillars of OECD, because they know what it's going to cost their digital economy. Ugandans, first, we don't know what we want. We're just rushing all over the place, ratifying things. But I think we should study more, understand the impact of this new area, and have a holistic uh, way of practice in this area. Otherwise, Kenya will keep on undercutting everyone in this region. 
And who knows, before you know it, no deals are coming to Uganda or we bring your Sudan. That's what I have to say. Thank you very much, Luis. Your question is noted. Uh, I'll just take another couple of questions. Lilian Omondi. Um, Lilian, your hand is up. Yes, Lydian, we can hear you. Hello? Yes. Oh, sorry, I logged in using my colleagues. Um, my name is Nzioka, I'm logged in using my colleague's account. Uh, uh, so from a Kenyan perspective, you'd find that the KRA does have powers under the Tax Procedures Act to demand from information from other institutions. However, it is held to certain standards, one of which is it cannot use, it can only use the information for um, calculation of tax liabilities, it cannot, and it also must uphold very strict standards of confidentiality. Um, that's how you'd find able to get information from the communications authority and other authorities. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, there are some comments as well on that. Even Tanzanian authority can obtain information from a third party who is liable to pay tax, such commercial, commercial banks, sell calls, and all the other people. And also, KRA has a statutory authority to access such information, notwithstanding the Data Protection Act of 2019, regulates how information is collected. And then the banks in Kenya, uh, when you're signing or opening up a bank account, you're required to, to, to allow them to, to give KRA such information, uh, uh, even credit reference bureaus and the likes. I know in Uganda, there was uh, a proposal to have the banks readily give this information to the URA and that was threatened down a couple of years ago. So I'm surprised our neighbors have taken this up. Um, but uh, Louis has a very important questions. And the question is, should we take on these digital services tax as emerging markets? Do you think it's still too young for us to take them on? Uh, the panel uh, over to you, Gilna, I think you're on. Uh... I think it's not about being young, but an, the, it's a global, I think, uh, a framework that they're trying to encompass, you know, all the countries. And unfortunately, to be uh, brutally honest, it's US who is arm twisting all the nations with retaliatory tariffs. And that's why all the other entities have already succumbed to it. It's only Kenya and Nigeria who are still contemplating, including uh, I think there's even Pakistan and uh, Sri Lanka that have also not joined the bandwagon yet. But at some point, uh, it might be that we will also be pressured into it. I know that there was a, an issue even raised by, I think, uh, the higher authority here that why aren't we also joining? But yet, I think the, the, ground, the ground feedback is that we are still uh, seeing how, how it will work for us. So that's um, from that perspective. So at some point, if obviously if Kenya also joins, I'm guessing everybody else might be also following suit from the East African countries if they, if we are also uh, the uh, the leaders in now joining from this perspective. And also, I think if the big company countries have also now uh, joined in, that means sooner or later DSTs are are going to go, and we'll be in this whole inclusive framework. And there are, there's a lot of work that is being done. OECD has also said uh, that they're going to be giving a lot of uh, support to the local authorities on how the implementation, including training on how the implementation would work. I think, especially in terms of calculating, as you're saying, how much would qualify as income from, for example, Kenya. So Kenya Revenue Authority needs to know how much income has been derived by that large MNC in Kenya, for example. So yeah, all that would obviously be. Uh, however, the smaller entities is the one that we don't know how they'll be dealt with then, because then who will take the revenue? So that's, I think, a more, a more um, country, country by country, they need to sit down and see whose revenue does it really belong to? Is it now going to be a consumer based or is it going to be, you know, the host country will be taking home that revenue. So, but from a la, uh, pillar one, you know, who qualifies that's, you know, this large MNC with this uh, amount of revenue, say that, you know, 20 billion euros, which they're saying they're going to, I think, reduce it to 
10 billion euros as the qualifying within, I think, seven years if this has been successfully implemented. And I think they're expecting to implement these rules, I think, from 2024, but correct me if I'm wrong. But I think that was the tentative rollout date for all the countries. So yeah, I think if we are also arm twisted and we are joining, then I'm guessing, then DST will be out and will now be on this inclusive framework where you only tax based on the revenue that has been earned in Kenya by that MN, uh, large MNC. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Jilna. Um, any other panelists to tackle that question? Are we too early to 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 uh, to adopt the digital tax mechanisms? I know Uganda has taken a little bit of uh, a backseat. Say, let's just first do a VAT without having a, a digital services tax. Um, anyone who wants to tackle that again? Hello, Ian. Uh, I think I, I can tackle the question from a different angle. The question uh, Louis said: Should we? Should uh, should we rush be rushing in into taxing uh, these digital platforms? Of course, the digital platforms are making money from our economies. If if the impact of the tax is on the digital platforms, then we should tax them. But if we make such policies that we are only taxing ourselves, we are making the digital platforms collect the money for the government from ourselves, from the uh, resident consumers and pass it to government, we are not doing a great job. That's why the OECD model is looking at the income. You are saying, that's why you have all these cases to do with Google and France and uh, other European countries there's, and India. They're saying you are making the money in our country, we should tax you. Currently, we are not taxing them. So if we are a poor economy and say, we don't want to tax you because we are too, uh, too primitive in tax terms, it doesn't really help us. But it is counterproductive where we think we are taxing them, but we are not actually taxing them. They are simply collecting money. In other words, they are getting a license to operate. They will be happy if some don't comply and they become a few who comply and collect the tax for you and pay it. And of course, even from their point of view, the more sophisticated they are, the easier they can pay because they need to do softwares which can comply and uh, respond on a monthly basis because in this case you are looking at filing tax returns almost in every country in the world every month you need to be a bit big you need to be sophisticated and you need to also understand that these countries can be these companies are more sophisticated than most of these countries because they are the ones who have done the application so you can actually find you are confusing yourselves but you must start. And I think Kenya will be an easy, will find it easier to participate with the, in the OECD discussions, having already started on the process, than another country which has taken a back seat. Uganda has taken about five years saying it has even suspended double taxation treaties. So what is it doing? What, where, where is the policy? So you, you, you cannot hide away from where the world is moving. From your introduction, you said we're in the digital age. So if you say, or oh, rather we want to remain in the analog age, well, I don't think that helps a lot. Thank you, Cephas. Um, I, I would like to throw it back to the, to, the, to the audience. I can see Noel. Noel, your hand is up. Um, Noel, you're allowed to talk. Your hand is up. Noel, your question, please, or comment. Noel, are you there? Okay, as Noel prepares to, to uh, give that question, there's Felso Nodongo who says, is a requirement to adhere to uniform digital taxation policies? Uh, Noel is on? Yes, Noel. Uh, Noel? Okay, as Noel still gets on, um, Felson Odongo is asking, is a requirement to adhere to uniform digital taxation policies contemplated by international bodies and regional organization likely to interfere with the autonomy of member states, especially third world countries? Uh, panel members, anyone wants to tackle Felson's question? 
would, would the adherence of a uniform digital tax policy uh, bring about uh, interference with the autonomy of, of states? That's Felson's uh, question. Uh, maybe I can answer that. I can yes. make my input on that. Yes, sir. So long as trade crosses borders, so long as money crosses borders, autonomy becomes less relevant. You, you have to follow the money. And that's why, as the journal said, the, the, uh, the US protects its economy because it knows almost all these digital platforms originate from the US and ultimately the money will go to the US. So they don't care what happens. That's why they are not so keen in this in this in the same way as the other OECD countries, because ultimately the money belongs to the uh, to the US. So if you follow the borders, if the money, the, the, the transactions are not following the borders, then you are not facing the reality because we are having digital platforms because they don't recognize borders. So borders uh, must be uh, over, 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 we must only be considered where it is in the interest of the country. But if your borders are being raided by business and taking away your money, then restricting yourself to the border doesn't help a lot. Uh, thank you, sir. First, Juvenal, Juve, no, you have your hand up. You want to comment on this? Yeah, I just, uh, just of, yeah, I agree with the uh, uh, first. Uh, but for us in East Africa, because we've been trying to promote East African community, um, you know, want the same currency, want to do business together. So, and if you look at Tanzania, for example, we don't have a double taxation agreement with anyone in East Africa. So, if you are supplying your electronic services from Kampala, the Islam, it's, this is going to be like a double taxation. Maybe our governments are going to sit down and realize this, and then we would have exemptions. Uh, for us within the East African community, Burundi, uh, DRC, um, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania. Because if we cannot even do that within our, uh, our, our, our sister countries, uh, that, that would be double taxation. So, because if you pay tax in Tanzania, you cannot even claim it in, in Kampala. You pay it in Kenya. I just paid tax in Nairobi last week. I cannot claim that tax in Tanzania uh, because you don't have any double taxation agreement. So I'm, I'm thinking that of course, we all want the government to collect taxes, but of course, also the investors have to be protected from double taxation. But I agree that if we are making money from our countries, then we should be able to at least contribute to the growth of the, of the economy and the country by paying taxes. Because it has, and as we are going into technology, uh, business is, is almost going to be um, entirely done on, um, uh, on the internet. In the next few years, it's already happening so much. So it is only fair that they pay their fair share uh, when they get income from our countries. But also double taxation uh, should be considered. And especially for us in East Africa, we need to consider our East African community and how this tax impacts us in the region. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you, Jeff. You know, as, as we wait for, I don't know if Noel is still, uh, Noel, you're still up for your question? Noel? Yeah. Yes, Joseph. Um, I would also want to add to that um, uh, from the perspective that um, having a uniform policy for um, the region, East Africa, but also Africa in general, would give us what I would term as a, a collective bargaining power. So um, just here, one of the panelists mentioned that they fear that uh, Kenya as an individual would perhaps be um, wrestled into um, a position which is not necessarily favorable for um, the Kenyan policy. But if we had a regional or even a continental um, uniform policy, then we would be in a position to have um, a strong bargaining power because uh, which would be uniform to all the countries because uh, we are more or less the same in terms of uh, being uh, emerging uh, or developing uh, countries. So it's quite important that, yes, we have a policy. I understand that in the process of making policies, uh, it's not a one size fits all uh, situation, but rather you have a general um, platform on which we all uh, work with, and uh, that would help us to be uh, um, stronger uh, in terms of uh, creating our position as against everyone trying to 
uh, be on their own. But yet again, um, an issue was raised here about um, uh, competitiveness and undercutting. Uh, so without a uniform policy, it would mean that uh, perhaps um, we being the underdogs in terms of the economy, and like you mentioned that the money uh, belongs to the Americans, would mean that then would start uh, undercutting each other. And uh, at the end of the day, ultimately, that would mean that we would be uh, doing ourselves an injustice in the process. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Many hands are coming up. Allow me to go to the attendants or attendees to be able to ask questions. Noel, your hand has been up for a while. Do you want to say something? After Noel, um, the use of Lilian Omondi also has their hand up. Noel? Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Noel. Okay, thank you. Sorry for technical issues since I'm on the road. Okay, my, my question or my thinking was on understanding from the experts here. Well, is there a way in which the, a worker who is working online, for example, let's say from one country, maybe I'm in one country working online, but with the firm which is in another country, is there a way that your working arrangement is subjected to taxation? I was just wondering if experts may enlighten, enlighten, enlighten at least a little bit on that issue particularly with the current move in which most of the enterprises they prefer uh, experts who are working from home online it is that which I, want, uh, I wanted to ask from the experts thank you uh, thank you noel just one last question from uh, the use of lillian lillian nomondi Okay, hi, it's Nsioka again. Um, so somebody earlier spoke about the need to harmonize double taxation within the East African community. Um, a while back, there was a double taxation agreement signed between the then existing members of the EAC. However, it's not one is the charter has not been the double taxation um, agreement has not been updated to reflect the current membership, or better still, it should just be amended to accommodate all members of the EAC. Um, but due to, I think it's enforcement protocols, it's not yet coming to force. But it should only deal with, I think, income taxes. Thank, thank you very much. Um, panelists, uh, anyone wants to tackle? I saw Doreen's hand up. Doreen, your hand was up. Do you want to say something? Maybe to Noel's question? And yes. This, uh, over to you. No, not exactly, but to address the question to whether we should go about how should we go about this digital um, taxation leg, um, laws? Is it appropriate? Is it the right time to do this or otherwise? In my view, I would say that considering the internet users and how globalization has been taken our country in this move, I would say this is the right time because Today's tax rules are not fit for the realities of modern digital economy and do not capture the current business model that can make profit from digital services in a country without being physically present. And current tax rules also fail to recognize the new ways in which profits are created in the digital uh, wide world and in particularly the role that users play in generating value for digital companies. So as a way of result, there is a disconnect or mismatch between where value is created and where taxes are paid. So this is the right term to codify or to work on this legal framework, but in a more fair um, taxation regime, with that which will be appropriate for each economy masses and realities yeah that thank, was you, my thoughts. thank you doreen anyone wants to tackle noel's question hello uh ian yes just say first i think i think the question Ian asked uh his question was that if i work in country b and i work on and i provide the service in country c 
how is that taxed? I believe that has always been taxable uh, as a management charge if you are not in the other country. So it was always uh, handled by the withholding taxes. If you would do that, uh, so the taxation of that transaction has always been there. It can only be done uh, effectively by the tax body if the person paying you makes returns. If the person paying you is making return, then they will reflect the expense they have uh, incurred in paying you, and therefore they will be required to withhold taxes. I think that has always been the model. Uh, thank you, sir. First, Juvenal, you have something to say? Uh, what was the question again? Um, the, the question was, was on, uh, I, I think what uh, uh, Sefas has answered was, was on the issue of working in different jurisdictions and providing uh, services um, in different jurisdictions. So you're, you're working from home in Tanzania, but you're, you're employed by a Ugandan entity. Would, would there be tax uh, on, on, on new services? I think that's what um, Sefas had answered. Is, you wanted to say something on that in addition to that? No, yeah, it depends on what you are doing. If you're an employee, of course, you are going to pay all the taxes in the country, pay as you earn, you know, uh, even in a if you are required to contribute. But if you're a service provider, and you are not registered there. Uh, if you are registered as a, as a permanent establishment, then you have to, of course, ac account for all your transactions and pay all the taxes. If you are an employee, then um, you have to pay all the taxes. But if you are, you are just supplying from abroad in the past, uh, all the services that are uh, brought in the country, you have to withhold 15%, for example, in Tanzania. And we, we have what we call reverse VAT. So, Imported services, there is a reverse VAT where you put it in and out in the same month. And um, if you don't, if you forget to claim the input, it expires after six months, but you must pay the output. So that one has been managed by uh, withholding taxes, as uh, Sefas has said. Uh, but also, um, our, even our governments, uh, you know, it's my personal experience. I don't think if most of our government don't even know where their people are working. If they wanted to expand the tax base, they first understand where all of their citizens are working. If you're a US citizen, wherever you work, you must pay tax again at home. But a Ugandan can go and work anywhere out there, and the government has no idea where that, that uh, citizen is, and he never pays any taxes uh, to the country. You know, so that's all I have to say about it. I think our governments in East Africa also should know where their citizens are working, and maybe they can start contributing taxes at home. If you work in London and you are Ugandan, you should be able to uh, pay some income tax and file returns in Uganda or in Tanzania or in Kenya. Or in, in, um, um, if you want to expand the tax base, uh, that's just my comment. Can I, can I add on to that? Uh, I think, yes, as you rightfully mentioned about the permanent establishment, and I think with the recent changes in the law and the definitions of permanent establishment becoming more and more stricter, I think one needs to really look at what is that person doing working from home because you're creating an issue for the employer that's outside in, in the country of residence. So are you creating a PE for them? So I think that needs to be looked at in detail before you know, uh, creating a problem for the, the, the entity that you work for because we don't know what your role is, what work you're doing, are you concluding contracts and everything. You know, It needs to be looked at in detail. But yeah, PE is a, a major concern across i think all all nations so to create a pe would be quite uh, bad for tax for tax purposes thank you uh, th thank you jilna um there's a, a question from one is steven he says what are the implications of such taxes to development of the technology industry in east africa as in one country's one country the tax for resident is extremely high other than one who isn't a resident? Do you think this will strive for the development of local digital platforms? The panel, panel members, this, this is your question. Uh, Could you repeat? Okay. Sorry, I, I missed. Sorry, uh, I sorry. missed that. Yes, okay. the, the, say first. You've got the question. The yes, I got the question, but I think. Uh, Normally, if you have a 
a startup, say, uh, technology developer, there will be normally other incentives or expenses which will, every, most countries will kind of uh, incentivize uh, innovators. This may not be seen from these tax rates because it will be more in the domestic taxes. So there will be capital deductions, uh, whatever deduction which are, which are inherent in the system, you may not be able to see them. Of course, it means that uh, it, uh, the developer would take time to start paying the taxes right away because uh, presumably the expenses will be taken into account. But as you may have realized, uh, the, the world is never flat. That's why almost all the innovators in the, in the big countries will do the IP, the intellectual property in their countries, but will do the hard uh, physical infrastructures in cheaper countries. So it is not a flat thing. There, there is a lot of planning involved. There, there will never be time when there's no planning. Uh, thank you, Sefas. Uh, Juna, you, you've got the question. Do you want me to repeat it? No, if you could please repeat. Sorry. Okay. So the question is, what are the implications of such taxes to development of the technology industry in East Africa? For example, one is paying higher taxes as a resident as compared to a non-resident. Do you think this will strive for the development of local digital platforms? I think we, what has been the trend, I would say, is that the local IP and whatever the digital uh, platforms that have been developed generally are not uh, developed in in country and if they are developed they're trying they are transferred outside to a lower tax jurisdictions where then the people pay a royalty from from kenya that's generally been the restructuring that has always been ongoing to avoid paying taxes in kenya because obviously you're moving the ip to an, a low tax or a no tax jurisdiction so from that reason i don't think that would be a diff uh, uh, something that somebody would uh, deter from developing. But now, since everybody is going to be on a global minimum tax under the OECD framework, I think that's what the OECD framework is trying to align, that there should be no, because what has been the trend is your IP is always sitting in a, in a country where there is no tax or low tax. So to avoid that, we are just bringing in, a, the, bring, the OECD is bringing in a, a global minimum tax at 15%. So um, I think even if they were to take it to that country, at least the minimum tax that they would need to pay would be 15 for that matter, compared to zero. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Juven. I don't know if your hand is up or it has always been up. I, I want to pick on you now, Juven, your, your remarks. Uh, as yeah, you I, think, I think it was, uh, my hand was up by mistake, but uh, I had your question saying uh, will this tax help promote the the local guys, uh, you know. I think the the foreign suppliers of these services will continue to supply the services because I believe um, even in their costing, they, they, they had always anticipated this to happen. If the local consumers of these services are doing business and they are doing good business, then I believe that the foreign guys will still continue to supply these services. Yes, so I don't, I don't say, I don't say, I, I don't say, um, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think it's going to have a big impact on uh, 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 either someone providing, uh, improving the, the circumstances of the local service provider, because some of these platforms are very expensive. Uh, most of them are foreign uh, supplied and foreign based, so I don't think it's going to create an impact, but I don't think it's going to scare away the people who have been providing the services, because I'm sure they have already been making money but not paying taxes. And now uh, they have to uh, do what they have been supposed to do uh, uh, in a long time. I just wanted to add that. But my hand will go down right now. Thank you, Juveno. Louis, um, you have a question. Louis Chizito. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you very well. Mine is a suggestion. I think we should go into now the mode of suggestions. 
if you look at economies that are actually taxing the digital economy, they have enforced or promoted things called like pro policies for uh, titled seed enterprise investment schemes. Now, I don't give a damn, we can keep taxing Google, Amazon, Facebook, the gaffers, the way they call them, the way the France's digital services tax have done it. That is perfectly fine. But you're not going to foster an, a competitive ecosystem without seed enterprise investment scheme. So I think the two should go hand in hand. You should have a position where if I'm an investor and I'm going to put some venture capital in a startup, I have reliefs, substantial reliefs, not half-baked reliefs, where I'm going to wake up in the morning and then there is uh, all this kind of VAT returns, then there is this, there is that. I think as a policy consideration, yes, we can move on with this uh, taxing. The, um, by the way, I am pro-taxing the big ones. The Facebooks, the, the Amazon, those ones won't go away however much we tax them because Facebook make Facebook in just four days makes five hundred and seventy million US dollars. Why don't they tax? They should pay their fair share. My uh, my problem is with half baked policy uh, formulation in some countries. You may find that they might create a one size fits all policy. For me, who is coming up with the, a merchant e commerce app, and then I before you know it, I can't even compete. So you are crowding out even with the small ones, in the larger scheme of things of a greater good of taxing. So I think let's look into as a region, and I think Kenya is trying a bit. Uganda, I think we should look at seed enterprise investment schemes. There are very many tech innovators and this techpreneurs in this economy. They are struggling. They, and, and that is my, my pain, really. And I feel I wish that discussion could go on next time we have such a discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Luis, for your uh, comments. Um, I want now to go back to panel members as we wrap up this discussion. I want to go to each and every individual panel, panel member. Um, one of the things that Doreen highlighted is a mismatch between where value is created and where profit is generated. It's a very big mismatch. And with the digital platforms, we see that that shifting of, of the intangibles or, or the, the hard to tax assets is it keep, keeps on moving and therefore we have an issue of global anti-base erosion so um we've had the experiences of uganda kenya tanzania burundi and we've, we've looked at what they're trying to do what they've tried to implement some of it is still nascent and virgin they're still trying to 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 cut their teeth as they implement these policies but i am sure as season tax experts you have uh, a look into what could be uh, as lewis has been putting it what could be the a better better policies what could be a better formulation of a, of a tax law tax regime to touch these big tech tech, tech giants or big 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 tech companies uh we, we, sh we shouldn't we shouldn't forget the fact that that uh we need the revenues but at the same time we need the technology to also develop so as as we close or oh, as, as we wrap up I, I want each and every one of the panelists to give us their take on what they think could be or would be a, 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 the, the best way of, of, of tackling this. I also want to put into consideration that right now we're looking at the companies who are uh, um, uh, virtually uh, working in, in different jurisdictions. But there will be situations where employment income taxes are going to be affected by virtual working machines or robots. And, and we are still discussing corporations uh, setting up virtually but we're going to also have algorithms and, and things, uh, robots and, and uh, artificial intelligence that now does what an employee should have been doing, but not typically your, your normal employee per se. So I want us to look at it that wide and, and give uh, probably your thoughts or your, your, your parting shots on what you think uh, the different jurisdiction could do. I'll just pick up our panelists at random, uh, starting with the, uh, Doreen Irakoze. What, what What's your view? What's your view on, on this? Thank you again, Chair. Um, from my perspective, I think government should first start with an economic impact assessment where they should be able to highlight the performance of their taxation revenue genera generated from those, those corporates and tech companies and then implement changes to tax law as to uh, and implement the tax laws 
based on their needs and based on their pace for them to for them to be able to capture the potential impact and unintended consequences that those amendments may have on revenue generation. And by doing so, they could review or improve their legal policy and regulatory environment for digital platform by establishing a solid framework for new taxation rules. And of course, embrace where appropriate multiple double taxation agreements. And again, this cannot be done, could not be done without a strong, um, a strong uh, stakeholder government system in digital transformation. These are my suggestions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Doreen. Um, over to you, Cephas. What, 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 what's your view? Thank you, Chair. I largely agree with Doreen. Um, if you, I'm just putting it in a different way. The ESC is supposed to have a harmonized, to be a harmonized market, single market, harmonized taxes, harmonized tax regimes. They have succeeded in the customs area. They have failed in the domestic tax areas. That's why there has been a double taxation model treaty on the drawing board finished ready for signature for more than 10 years because of um, the borders and the perceptions of competition and things like that. But apart from that, I think we, we, we have to synergize and study this thing and try to come out with the best case scenario. Well, what we are doing now is throwing taxes every other year, OTT, data tax, mobile money tax, just to collect money without doing a very careful analysis of the tax impact. So we really need to put more time to study this and learn from the best. Thank you. Thank you, Sefas. Uh, Gilna? Thank you. Uh, I think for me, since the pressure is on the inclusive framework. One needs to understand that what is going to be, who is going to benefit from this whole framework. And it looks like with the proposal that's there, it's obviously the, the large MNEs are going to benefit in their host countries. I mean, it looks like, will there really be uh, a share that will come to a developed country that really reflects you know the revenue that they are actually earning from that country so i think that 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 part is not coming out clearly in my view um, and as uh, doreen said i think an economic analysis is also required as to what benefits are going to be there if a global uh, approach is being undertaken and we are all joining this uh, framework then what is it that each country is going to uh, get out of it is that really beneficial to us i mean that part i has not come out clearly um i think from a taxing because from a tax perspective um we are in that position where we are taking on the western policies but we are not able to copy or implement them correctly that's what's happening in kenya you try and adopt a policy from the west especially the UK, but yet you're not even able to implement it properly and correctly. There are a lot of gray areas. So we are all left in a limbo trying to resolve them with the revenue authorities. Hence, there are too many disputes for any, which makes even doing business in Kenya quite unattractive then. Because if you're always uh, in, uh, with a, in a dispute with a revenue authority, it also frustrates the 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 investor the foreign investors as well not just the local but even the foreign so i think that part needs to be if we are adopting then we need to ensure that our local laws obviously are done properly written properly and also the fact that um, all these double tax agreements that we have are also um, aligned with the global framework of taxation so that there is no Transfer pricing also will need to be looked at as usual because then 
what is the who is taxing what part will also come in so there are a few things that need to be looked at and somebody obviously uh, needs to look into this very very clearly thank you uh, thank you very much Jilna. before i let you go someone has a question for you could Jilna please elucidate more on the concept of permanent establishment as regards taxation that's from felson Jilna, that's directly to you okay um so yeah permanent establishment i can comment from a kenyan tax perspective um uh there was a new definition that was provided which was a rather vast definition under our finance act 2021 uh, which provides obviously if you have a fixed place here in Kenya, you know, if you have the likes of a building site for a service industry, I think um, they brought in that if you were a consultant, for example, who was in the country for even 90 days or more, then you would be deemed to be having a permanent establishment in Kenya. But it's a, a bit of a, a, a long definition, so covering quite an extensive amount of. Uh, captures in there so one needs to look at that in detail but i'm happy to share if somebody wants a more detailed um, opinion because um, i can't go through it i don't have it on top of my head at the moment the wordings of the act uh, thank you jilna um joseph over to you your parting shots um thank you very much so um my parting thoughts are more or less uh, what um, the previous uh, speakers have said, but uh, I would only bring it back to policy, policy, and policy. Uh, throughout the webinar, you could easily tell that um, what is happening in Africa and in East Africa is that we're being more reactive um, to um, what is out there and what is happening. We've not taken time to sit down uh, as uh, as a continent, as a region, to actually create a policy that is um, favorable to our conditions to start with, but is also uniform. Uh, so I suppose, and I would suggest that uh, we need to stop, think, uh, stop being reactive and create a policy that works for us. And some of the things we need to take into consideration are, are two main things I think we have to take into consideration. The first is, who are we really taxing uh, when we create these digital taxes? Uh, isn't it that these taxes uh, are being passed on to the end users and uh, the MNEs are actually only being conduits uh, for collecting those taxes? We should be able to consider who, who is actually bearing uh, the burden of that. And then two, um, we need to understand where Africa is positioned, what, um, is the role and importance of uh, technology and all the services we get through technology uh, in terms of development of Africa. Uh, studies have clearly shown that um, uh, we need uh, to develop our technology and use of technology to be able to grow our economies. And that in the end would actually uh, bring about development that would increase our tax base. So. Uh, are we going to tax ourselves? Uh, are we going to tax technology into under development? That's the la that's my parting question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. Lastly, Juveno, um, your parting shot, sir. Um, first, uh, this was a very important discussion. As you can see, um, uh, everyone is interested in it. But like I said, for us in Tanzania, um, I think next time we should just have the Minister of Finance uh, on the platform, and he will be able to answer some of these questions, even take the concerns. As you can see, uh, everyone is concerned. But I believe that uh, as East Africa, we need to expand our tax base, the platforms. Business now is done a lot of times on the internet, and most of these guys have not been paying taxes. I think the government is on the right track the only issue is how to harmonize it and to avoid uh, any duplication and uh, hindering businesses. But uh, for me, I believe that what they have done uh, is, um, is long overdue because these guys have been coming here and doing a lot of business and taking money out of the economy and not paying any taxes. So I think this is, this is the way to go. 
the uh, issues that are there, the, the different issues that are there, the different questions, interpretations, with the time in the next three, four years will be ironed out. And at the end of the day, we'll come up with a very good uh, policy and law that will address almost all these concerns. But I think the government is on the right track and I'm looking forward to see how this will be implemented and also to assist uh, my clients who are out of the country on how to comply with the law because it's now the law of the land in Tanzania and the only way forward is to comply with it the way it is until the next amendments are made in the next uh in the next financial year but thank you very much uh for the opportunity to speak on this uh, webinar uh, thank you very much our uh, panelists um from all over east africa we really appreciate uh, your time taken to enlighten us we have been uh about 160 attendants give or take and uh, i'm sure the questions have been very evolving and uh, your insights have been even better uh, we thank the technology media and telecommunications committee of east african law society for organizing this insightful discussion uh janice david segano clever uh, we, we thank you very much for organizing this and as you see the discussion continues um uh, my parting shots would be that uh if you want to know um the, the the road which you're taking you should ask those ones who are coming back kenya has already started on this journey uh, they have uh, put in place uh, interesting mechanisms to make sure that digital taxes are collected perhaps you shall learn from kenya but more importantly we need to develop what suits the local or the jurisdiction that you you come from uh, before i close i want to uh, clever clever your hand is up you want to say something I will let you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I will be very quick on behalf of the chair who is able to attend and on my behalf. I would like to thank you, to thank everyone, uh, panelists, participants, and the organizing uh, team, uh, David, uh, Janice, everyone. Thank you very much. It is very uh, up to date. It's white. We look at uh, the possibility, maybe, of having another webinar with the same topic or a, a related one. Uh, I wish you a very wonderful. Thank you very much, Clever. Thank you, everybody. Um, I, I think I, I can't add more to the vice chairperson of the TMT committee. Uh, we now close this particular discussion on, on tax. Thank you very much.